History of Artificial Intelligence, Wikipedia Audio The history of artificial intelligence began in antiquity, with myths, stories, and rumors of artificial beings endowed with intelligence or consciousness by master craftsmen, as Pamela McCorduck writes, AI began with an ancient wish to forge the gods. The seeds of modern AI were planted by classical philosophers who attempted to describe the process of human thinking as the mechanical manipulation of symbols. This work culminated in the invention of the programmable digital computer in the 1940s, a machine based on the abstract essence of mathematical reasoning. This device and the ideas behind it inspired a handful of scientists to begin seriously discussing the possibility of building an electronic brain. The field of AI research was founded at a workshop held on the campus of Dartmouth College during the summer of 1956. Those who attended would become the leaders of AI research for decades. Many of them predicted that a machine as intelligent as a human being would exist in no more than a generation and they were given millions of dollars to make this vision come true. Precursors Eventually it became obvious that they had grossly underestimated the difficulty of the project due to computer hardware limitations. In 1973, in response to the criticism of James Lighthill and ongoing pressure from Congress, the U.S. and British governments stopped funding undirected research into artificial intelligence, and the difficult years that followed would later be known as an AI winter. Seven years later, a visionary initiative by the Japanese government inspired governments and industry to provide AI with billions of dollars but by the late 80s the investors became disillusioned by the absence of the needed computer power and withdrew funding again. Investment and interest in AI boomed in the first decades of the 21st century, when machine learning was successfully applied to many problems in academia and industry due to the presence of powerful computer hardware. As in previous AI summers, some observers predicted the imminent arrival of artificial general intelligence, a machine with intellectual capabilities that exceed the abilities of human beings. 1958, H. A. Simon and Alan Newell, within 10 years a digital computer will be the world's chess champion and within 10 years a digital computer will discover and prove an important new mathematical theorem, 1965. H. A. Simon, machines will be capable, within 20 years, of doing any work a man can do, 1967, Marvin Minsky, within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved, 1970, Marvin Minsky, in from 3 to 8 years we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. McCorduck writes artificial intelligence in one form or another is an idea that has pervaded Western intellectual history, a dream in urgent need of being realized, expressed in humanity's myths, legends, stories, speculation, and clockwork automatons. Mechanical men and artificial beings appear in Greek myths, such as the golden robots of Hephaestus and Pygmalion's Galatea. In the Middle Ages, there were rumors of secret mystical or alchemical means of placing mind into matter, such as Jaber Ibn Hayyan S. Taquin, Paracelsus Homunculus and Rabbi Judah Lau S. Golem. By the 19th century, ideas about artificial men and thinking machines were developed in fiction, as in Mary Shelley S. Frankenstein or Carol A. Peck S. R. U. R., and speculation, such as Samuel Butler S. Darwin among the machines. AI has continued to be an important element of science fiction into the present. Realistic humanoid automatons were built by craftsmen from every civilization, including Yan Shi, 
Hero of Alexandria, Aljazeera, Pierre Jacquet Draws, and Wolfgang von Kempelen. The oldest known automatons were the sacred statues of ancient Egypt and Greece. The faithful believed that craftsmen had imbued these figures with very real minds, capable of wisdom and emotion. Hermes Trismegistus wrote that by discovering the true nature of the gods, man has been able to reproduce it. Artificial intelligence is based on the assumption that the process of human thought can be mechanized. The study of mechanical or formal reasoning has a long history. Chinese, Indian and Greek philosophers all developed structured methods of formal deduction in the first millennium BCE. Their ideas were developed over the centuries by philosophers such as Aristotle, Euclid, Alchrism and European scholastic philosophers such as William of Ockham and Duns Scotus. Majorcan philosopher Ramon Lyol developed several logical machines devoted to the production of knowledge by logical means. Lyol described his machines as mechanical entities that could combine basic and undeniable truths by simple logical operations, produced by the machine by mechanical meanings, in such ways as to produce all the possible knowledge. Lyol's work had a great influence on Gottfried Leibniz who redeveloped his ideas. Limited computer power, there was not enough memory or processing speed to accomplish anything truly useful. For example, Ross Quillian's successful work on natural language was demonstrated with a vocabulary of only 20 words, because that was all that would fit in memory. Hans Moravec argued in 1976 that computers were still millions of times too weak to exhibit intelligence. He suggested an analogy, artificial intelligence requires computer power in the same way that aircraft require horsepower. Below a certain threshold, it's impossible, but, as power increases, eventually it could become easy. With regard to computer vision, Moravec estimated that simply matching the edge and motion detection capabilities of human retina in real time would require a general-purpose computer capable of 10-9 operations slash second. As of 2011, practical computer vision applications require 10,000 to 1 million MIPS. By comparison, the fastest supercomputer in 1976, Cray-1, was only capable of around 80 to 130 MIPS, and a typical desktop computer at the time achieved less than 1 MIPS, intractability and the combinatorial explosion. In 1972 Richard Karp showed there are many problems that can probably only be solved in exponential time. Finding optimal solutions to these problems requires unimaginable amounts of computer time except when the problems are trivial. This almost certainly meant that many of the toy solutions used by AI would probably never scale up into useful systems, common sense knowledge and reasoning. Many important artificial intelligence applications like vision or natural language require simply enormous amounts of information about the world, the program needs to have some idea of what it might be looking at or what it is talking about. This requires that the program know most of the same things about the world that a child does. Researchers soon discovered that this was a truly vast amount of information. No one in 1970 could build a database so large and no one knew how a program might learn so much information, more of X paradox, proving theorems and solving geometry problems is comparatively easy for computers, but a supposedly simple task like recognizing a face or crossing a room without bumping into anything is extremely difficult. This helps explain why research into vision and robotics had made so little progress by the middle 1970s, the frame and qualification problems.
AI researchers who used logic discovered that they could not represent ordinary deductions that involved planning or default reasoning without making changes to the structure of logic itself. They developed new logics to try to solve the problems. In the 17th century, Leibniz, Thomas Hobbes, and René Descartes explored the possibility that all rational thought could be made as systematic as algebra or geometry. Hobbes famously wrote in Leviathan, Reason is nothing but reckoning. Leibniz envisioned a universal language of reasoning which would reduce argumentation to calculation, so that there would be no more need of disputation between two philosophers than between two accountants. For it would suffice to take their pencils in hand, down to their slates, and to say each other, let us calculate. These philosophers had begun to articulate the physical symbol system hypothesis that would become the guiding faith of AI research. In the 20th century, the study of mathematical logic provided the essential breakthrough that made artificial intelligence seem plausible. The foundations had been set by such works as Boole's The Laws of Thought and Frege's Begrift Rift. Building on Frege's system, Russell and Whitehead presented a formal treatment of the foundations of mathematics in their masterpiece, The Principia Mathematica in 1913. Inspired by Russell's success, David Hilbert challenged mathematicians of the 1920s and 30s to answer this fundamental question, can all of mathematical reasoning be formalized? His question was answered by Godel's incompleteness proof, Turing's machine and Church's lambda calculus. AI in myth, fiction, and speculation Their answer was surprising in two ways. First, they proved that there were, in fact, limits to what mathematical logic could accomplish. But second their work suggested that, within these limits, any form of mathematical reasoning could be mechanized. The Church-Turing thesis implied that a mechanical device, shuffling symbols as simple as zero and one, could imitate any conceivable process of mathematical deduction. The key insight was the Turing machine a simple theoretical construct that captured the essence of abstract symbol manipulation. This invention would inspire a handful of scientists to begin discussing the possibility of thinking machines. Calculating machines were built in antiquity and improved throughout history by many mathematicians, including philosopher Gottfried Leibniz. In the early 19th century, Charles Babbage designed a programmable computer, although it was never built. Ada Lovelace speculated that the machine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. The first modern computers were the massive code-breaking machines of the Second World War. The latter two of these machines were based on the theoretical foundation laid by Alan Turing and developed by John von Neumann. In the 1940s and 50s, a handful of scientists from a variety of fields began to discuss the possibility of creating an artificial brain. The field of artificial intelligence research was founded as an academic discipline in 1956. The earliest research into thinking machines was inspired by a confluence of ideas that became prevalent in the late 30s, 40s, and early 50s. Recent research in neurology had shown that the brain was an electrical network of neurons that fired in all or nothing pulses. Norbert Wiener's cybernetics described control and stability in electrical networks. Claude Shannon's information theory described digital signals. Alan Turing's theory of computation showed that any form of computation could be described digitally. The close relationship between these ideas suggested that it might be possible to construct an electronic brain. 
Examples of work in this vein includes robots such as W. Gray Walter S. Turtles and the Johns Hopkins Beast. These machines did not use computers, digital electronics, or symbolic reasoning, they were controlled entirely by analog circuitry. Walter Pitts and Warren McCulloch analyzed networks of idealized artificial neurons and showed how they might perform simple logical functions. They were the first to describe what later researchers would call a neural network. One of the students inspired by Pitts and McCulloch was a young Marvin Minsky, then a 24-year-old graduate student. In 1951 he built the first neural net machine, the SNARK. Minsky was to become one of the most important leaders and innovators in AI for the next 50 years. Automatons Formal Reasoning in 1950 Alan Turing published a landmark paper in which he speculated about the possibility of creating machines that think. He noted that thinking is difficult to define and devised his famous Turing test. If a machine could carry on a conversation that was indistinguishable from a conversation with a human being, then it was reasonable to say that the machine was thinking. This simplified version of the problem allowed Turing to argue convincingly that a thinking machine was at least plausible and the paper answered all the most common objections to the proposition. The Turing test was the first serious proposal in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. Computer Science The Birth of Artificial Intelligence 1952-1956 Cybernetics and Early Neural Networks Turing's Test Game AI In 1951, using the Ferranti Mark I machine of the University of Manchester, Christopher Strachey wrote a checkers program and Dietrich Prinz wrote one for chess. Arthur Samuel S. Checkers program, developed in the middle 50s and early 60s, eventually achieved sufficient skill to challenge a respectable amateur. Game AI would continue to be used as a measure of progress in AI throughout its history. When access to digital computers became possible in the middle 50s, a few scientists instinctively recognized that a machine that could manipulate numbers could also manipulate symbols and that the manipulation of symbols could well be the essence of human thought. This was a new approach to creating thinking machines. In 1955, Alan Newell and Herbert A. Simon created the Logic Theorist. The program would eventually prove 38 of the first 52 theorems in Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, and find new and more elegant proofs for some. Simon said that they had solved the venerable mind-slash-body problem, explaining how a system composed of matter can have the properties of mind. Symbolic Reasoning and the Logic Theorist The Dartmouth Conference of 1956 was organized by Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, and two senior scientists, Claude Shannon and Nathan Rochester of IBM. The proposal for the conference included this assertion, Every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. The participants included Ray Solomonoff, Oliver Selfridge, Trenchard Moore, Arthur Samuel, Alan Newell and Herbert A. Simon, all of whom would create important programs during the first decades of AI research. At the conference Newell and Simon debuted the logic theorist and McCarthy persuaded the attendees to accept artificial intelligence as the name of the field. The 1956 Dartmouth conference was the moment that AI gained its name, its mission, its first success and its major players, and is widely considered the birth of AI. The years after the Dartmouth conference were an era of discovery of sprinting across new ground. The programs that were developed during this time were, 
to most people, simply astonishing, computers were solving algebra word problems, proving theorems in geometry and learning to speak English. Few at the time would have believed that such intelligent behavior by machines was possible at all. Researchers expressed an intense optimism in private and in print, predicting that a fully intelligent machine would be built in less than 20 years. Government agencies like DARPA poured money into the new field. There were many successful programs and new directions in the late 50s and 1960s. Among the most influential were these. Many early AI programs used the same basic algorithm. To achieve some goal, they proceeded step by step towards it as if searching through a maze, backtracking whenever they reached a dead end. This paradigm was called reasoning as search. The principal difficulty was that, for many problems, the number of possible paths through the maze was simply astronomical. Researchers would reduce the search space by using heuristics or rules of thumb that would eliminate those paths that were unlikely to lead to a solution. Newell and Simon tried to capture a general version of this algorithm in a program called the General Problem Solver. Other searching programs were able to accomplish impressive tasks like solving problems in geometry and algebra, such as Herbert Galernter's Geometry Theorem Prover and Saint, written by Minsky's student James Slagle. Other programs searched through goals and sub-goals to plan actions, like the STRIPS system developed at Stanford to control the behavior of their robot Shaky. An important goal of AI research is to allow computers to communicate in natural languages like English. An early success was Daniel Bobro's program student, which could solve high school algebra word problems. Dartmouth Conference 1956, The Birth of AI a semantic net represents concepts as nodes and relations among concepts as links between the nodes. The first AI program to use a semantic net was written by Ross Quillian and the most successful version was Roger Skank's Conceptual Dependency Theory. Joseph Wee Eisenbaum's Eliza could carry out conversations that were so realistic that users occasionally were fooled into thinking they were communicating with a human being and not a program. But in fact, Eliza had no idea what she was talking about. She simply gave a canned response or repeated back what was said to her, rephrasing her response with a few grammar rules. Eliza was the first chatterbot. The Golden Years 1956-1974 In the late 60s, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert of the MIT AI Laboratory proposed that AI research should focus on artificially simple situations known as micro-worlds. They pointed out that in successful sciences like physics, Basic principles were often best understood using simplified models like frictionless planes or perfectly rigid bodies. Much of the research focused on a blocks world, which consists of colored blocks of various shapes and sizes arrayed on a flat surface. This paradigm led to innovative work in machine vision by Gerald Sussman, Adolfo Guzman, David Waltz, and especially Patrick Winston. At the same time, Minsky and Papert built a robot arm that could stack blocks, bringing the blocks world to life. The crowning achievement of the microworld program was Terry Winograd S. Schrodlu. It could communicate in ordinary English sentences, plan operations, and execute them. The Work Reasoning as Search Natural Language the first generation of AI researchers made these predictions about their work. In June 1963, MIT received a $2.2 million grant from the newly created Advanced Research Projects Agency. 
The money was used to fund Project MAC which subsumed the AI group founded by Minsky and McCarthy five years earlier. DARPA continued to provide $3 million a year until the 70s. DARPA made similar grants to Newell and Simon's program at CMU and to the Stanford AI project. Another important AI laboratory was established at Edinburgh University by Donald Mickey in 1965. These four institutions would continue to be the main centers of AI research in academia for many years. The money was proffered with few strings attached, J.C.R. Licklider, then the director of ARPA, believed that his organization should fund people, not projects and allowed researchers to pursue whatever directions might interest them. This created a freewheeling atmosphere at MIT that gave birth to the hacker culture, but this hands-off approach would not last. In Japan, Waisda University initiated the WABO project in 1967, and in 1972 completed the WABO-1 the world's first full-scale intelligent humanoid robot, or android. Its limb control system allowed it to walk with the lower limbs, and to grip and transport objects with hands, using tactile sensors. Its vision system allowed it to measure distances and directions to objects using external receptors, artificial eyes, and ears and its conversation system allowed it to communicate with a person in Japanese, with an artificial mouth. In the 70s, AI was subject to critiques and financial setbacks. AI researchers had failed to appreciate the difficulty of the problems they faced. Their tremendous optimism had raised expectations impossibly high, and when the promised results failed to materialize, funding for AI disappeared. At the same time, the field of connectionism was shut down almost completely for ten years by Marvin Minsky's devastating criticism of perceptrons. Despite the difficulties with public perception of AI in the late 70s, new ideas were explored in logic programming, common sense reasoning and many other areas. In the early 70s, the capabilities of AI programs were limited. Even the most impressive could only handle trivial versions of the problems they were supposed to solve, all the programs were, in some sense, toys. AI researchers had begun to run into several fundamental limits that could not be overcome in the 1970s. Although some of these limits would be conquered in later decades, others still stymie the field to this day. The agencies which funded AI research became frustrated with the lack of progress and eventually cut off almost all funding for undirected research into AI. The pattern began as early as 1966 when the ALPAC report appeared criticizing machine translation efforts. After spending $20 million, the NRC ended all support. In 1973, the Lighthill Report on the State of AI Research in England criticized the utter failure of AI to achieve its grandiose objectives and led to the dismantling of AI research in that country. DARPA was deeply disappointed with researchers working on the Speech Understanding Research Program at CMU and cancelled an annual grant of $3 million. By 1974, Funding for AI projects was hard to find. Hans Moravec blamed the crisis on the unrealistic predictions of his colleagues. Many researchers were caught up in a web of increasing exaggeration. However, there was another issue, since the passage of the Mansfield Amendment in 1969, DARPA had been under increasing pressure to fund mission-oriented direct research rather than basic undirected research. Funding for the creative, freewheeling exploration that had gone on in the 60s would not come from DARPA. Instead, the money was directed at specific projects with clear objectives, 
such as autonomous tanks and battle management systems. Several philosophers had strong objections to the claims being made by AI researchers. One of the earliest was John Lucas, who argued that Godel's incompleteness theorem showed that a formal system could never see the truth of certain statements, while a human being could. Hubert Dreyfus ridiculed the broken promises of the 60s and critiqued the assumptions of AI, arguing that human reasoning actually involved very little symbol processing and a great deal of embodied, instinctive, unconscious know-how. John Searle's Chinese Room argument, presented in 1980, attempted to show that a program could not be said to understand the symbols that it uses. If the symbols have no meaning for the machine, Searle argued, then the machine cannot be described as thinking. These critiques were not taken seriously by AI researchers, often because they seemed so far off the point. Problems like intractability and common sense knowledge seemed much more immediate and serious. It was unclear what difference know-how or intentionality made to an actual computer program. Minsky said of Dreyfus and Searle they misunderstand, and should be ignored. Dreyfus, who taught at MIT, was given a cold shoulder, he later said that AI researchers dared not be seen having lunch with me. Joseph Wee Eisenbaum, the author of Eliza, felt his colleague's treatment of Dreyfus was unprofessional and childish. Although he was an outspoken critic of Dreyfus' positions, he deliberately made it plain that theirs was not the way to treat a human being. We Eisenbaum began to have serious ethical doubts about AI when Kenneth Colby wrote Doctor, a chatterbot therapist. We Eisenbaum was disturbed that Colby saw his mindless program as a serious therapeutic tool. A feud began and the situation was not helped when Colby did not credit Wee Eisenbaum for his contribution to the program. In 1976, Wee Eisenbaum published Computer Power and Human Reason which argued that the misuse of artificial intelligence has the potential to devalue human life. A perceptron was a form of neural network introduced in 1958 by Frank Rosenblatt who had been a schoolmate of Marvin Minsky at the Bronx High School of Science. Like most AI researchers, he was optimistic about their power, predicting that Perceptron may eventually be able to learn, make decisions, and translate languages. An active research program into the paradigm was carried out throughout the 60s but came to a sudden halt with the publication of Minsky and Papert's 1969 book Perceptrons. It suggested that there were severe limitations to what Perceptrons could do and that Frank Rosenblatt's predictions had been grossly exaggerated. The effect of the book was devastating. Virtually no research at all was done in connectionism for ten years. Eventually, a new generation of researchers would revive the field and thereafter it would become a vital and useful part of artificial intelligence. Rosenblatt would not live to see this, as he died in a boating accident shortly after the book was published. Logic was introduced into AI research as early as 1958 by John McCarthy in his advice taker proposal. In 1963, J. Allen Robinson had discovered a simple method to implement deduction on computers, the resolution and unification algorithm. However, straightforward implementations, like those attempted by McCarthy and his students in the late 60s, were especially intractable. The programs required astronomical numbers of steps to prove simple theorems. A more fruitful approach to logic was developed in the 1970s by Robert Kowalski at the University of Edinburgh, and soon this led to the collaboration with French researchers Elaine Colmer-Auer and Philippe Russell who created the successful logic programming language Prolog. 
Prolog uses a subset of logic that permit tractable computation. Rules would continue to be influential, providing a foundation for Edward Feigenbaum's expert systems and the continuing work by Alan Newell and Herbert A. Simon that would lead to SOAR and their unified theories of cognition. Critics of the logical approach noted, as Dreyfus had, that human beings rarely used logic when they solved problems. Experiments by psychologists like Peter Wason, Eleanor Roche, Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman, and others provided proof. McCarthy responded that what people do is irrelevant. He argued that what is really needed are machines that can solve problems not machines that think as people do. Among the critics of McCarthy's approach were his colleagues across the country at MIT. Marvin Minsky, Seymour Papert, and Roger Skank were trying to solve problems like story understanding and object recognition that required a machine to think like a person. In order to use ordinary concepts like chair or restaurant they had to make all the same illogical assumptions that people normally made. Unfortunately, imprecise concepts like these are hard to represent in logic. Gerald Sussman observed that using precise language to describe essentially imprecise concepts doesn't make them any more precise. Skank described their anti-logic approaches as scruffy, as opposed to the neat paradigms used by McCarthy, Kowalski, Feigenbaum, Newell, and Simon. In 1975, in a seminal paper, Minsky noted that many of his fellow scruffy researchers were using the same kind of tool, a framework that captures all our common sense assumptions about something. For example, if we use the concept of a bird, there is a constellation of facts that immediately come to mind, we might assume that it flies, eats worms and so on. We know these facts are not always true and that deductions using these facts will not be logical, but these structured sets of assumptions are part of the context of everything we say and think. He called these structures frames. Skank used a version of frames he called scripts to successfully answer questions about short stories in English. Many years later object-oriented programming would adopt the essential idea of inheritance from AI research on frames. In the 1980s a form of AI program called Expert Systems was adopted by corporations around the world and knowledge became the focus of mainstream AI research. In those same years, the Japanese government aggressively funded AI with its fifth-generation computer project. Another encouraging event in the early 1980s was the revival of connectionism in the work of John Hopfield and David Rumel Hart. Once again, AI had achieved success. An expert system is a program that answers questions or solves problems about a specific domain of knowledge, using logical rules that are derived from the knowledge of experts. The earliest examples were developed by Edward Feigenbaum and his students. Dendril, begun in 1965, identified compounds from spectrometer readings. Mycin, developed in 1972, diagnosed infectious blood diseases. They demonstrated the feasibility of the approach. Expert systems restricted themselves to a small domain of specific knowledge and their simple design made it relatively easy for programs to be built and then modified once they were in place. All in all, the programs proved to be useful, something that AI had not been able to achieve up to this point. In 1980, an expert system called XCON was completed at CMU for the Digital Equipment Corporation. It was an enormous success, it was saving the company $40 million annually by 1986. Corporations around the world began to develop and deploy expert systems and by 1985 they were spending over a billion dollars on AI, 
most of it to in-house AI departments. An industry grew up to support them, including hardware companies like Symbolics and Lisp machines and software companies such as IntelliCorp and Ion. The power of expert systems came from the expert knowledge they contained. They were part of a new direction in AI research that had been gaining ground throughout the 70s. AI researchers were beginning to suspect reluctantly, for it violated the scientific canon of parsimony that intelligence might very well be based on the ability to use large amounts of diverse knowledge in different ways, writes Pamela McCorduck. He great lesson from the 1970s was that intelligent behavior depended very much on dealing with knowledge, sometimes quite detailed knowledge, of a domain where a given task lay. Knowledge-based systems and knowledge engineering became a major focus of AI research in the 1980s. The 1980s also saw the birth of Psyche, the first attempt to attack the common sense knowledge problem directly by creating a massive database that would contain all the mundane facts that the average person knows. Douglas Lennett, who started and led the project, argued that there is no shortcut the only way for machines to know the meaning of human concepts is to teach them, one concept at a time, by hand. The project was not expected to be completed for many decades. Chess playing programs High Tech and Deep Thought defeated chess masters in 1989. Both were developed by Carnegie Mellon University, Deep Thought Development paved the way for Deep Blue. In 1981, the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry set aside $850 million for the fifth generation computer project. Their objectives were to write programs and build machines that could carry on conversations, translate languages, interpret pictures, and reason like human beings. Much to the chagrin of Scruffies, they chose Prolog as the primary computer language for the project. Other countries responded with new programs of their own. The UK began the 350 million Alvi project. A consortium of American companies formed the Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation to fund large-scale projects in AI and information technology. DARPA responded as well, founding the Strategic Computing Initiative and tripling its investment in AI between 1984 and 1988. In 1982, Physicist John Hopfield was able to prove that a form of neural network could learn and process information in a completely new way. Around the same time, David Rumelhart popularized a new method for training neural networks called backpropagation. These two discoveries revived the field of connectionism which had been largely abandoned since 1970. The new field was unified and inspired by the appearance of parallel distributed processing in 1986 a two-volume collection of papers edited by Rumelhart and psychologist James McClelland. Neural networks would become commercially successful in the 1990s, when they began to be used as the engines driving programs like optical character recognition and speech recognition. The business community's fascination with AI rose and fell in the 80s in the classic pattern of an economic bubble. The collapse was in the perception of AI by government agencies and investors the field continued to make advances despite the criticism. Rodney Brooks and Hans Moravec, researchers from the related field of robotics, argued for an entirely new approach to artificial intelligence. The term AI winter was coined by researchers who had survived the funding cuts of 1974 when they became concerned that enthusiasm for expert systems had spiraled out of control and that disappointment would certainly follow. Their fears were well founded, in the late 80s and early 90s, AI suffered a series of financial setbacks. 
The first indication of a change in weather was the sudden collapse of the market for specialized AI hardware in 1987. Desktop computers from Apple and IBM had been steadily gaining speed and power and in 1987 they became more powerful than the more expensive Lisp machines made by Symbolics and others. There was no longer a good reason to buy them. An entire industry worth half a billion dollars was demolished overnight. Eventually the earliest successful expert systems, such as XCON, proved too expensive to maintain. They were difficult to update, they could not learn, they were brittle, and they fell prey to problems that had been identified years earlier. Expert systems proved useful, but only in a few special contexts. In the late 80s, the Strategic Computing Initiative cut funding to AI deeply and brutally. New leadership at DARPA had decided that AI was not the next wave and directed funds towards projects that seemed more likely to produce immediate results. By 1991, the impressive list of goals penned in 1981 for Japan's fifth-generation project had not been met. Indeed, some of them, like carry on a casual conversation had not been met by 2010. As with other AI projects, expectations had run much higher than what was actually possible. In the late 80s, several researchers advocated a completely new approach to artificial intelligence, based on robotics. They believed that, to show real intelligence, a machine needs to have a body it needs to perceive, move, survive, and deal with the world. They argued that these sensory motor skills are essential to higher level skills like common sense reasoning and that abstract reasoning was actually the least interesting or important human skill. They advocated building intelligence from the bottom up. The approach revived ideas from cybernetics and control theory that had been unpopular since the 60s. Another precursor was David Marr who had come to MIT in the late 70s from a successful background in theoretical neuroscience to lead the group studying vision. He rejected all symbolic approaches, arguing that AI needed to understand the physical machinery of vision from the bottom up before any symbolic processing took place. In a 1990 paper, Elephants Don't Play Chess, Robotics researcher Rodney Brooks took direct aim at the physical symbol system hypothesis, arguing that symbols are not always necessary since the world is its own best model. It is always exactly up to date. It always has every detail there is to be known. The trick is to sense it appropriately and often enough. In the 80s and 90s, Many cognitive scientists also rejected the symbol processing model of the mind and argued that the body was essential for reasoning, a theory called the embodied mind thesis. The field of AI, now more than a half a century old, finally achieved some of its oldest goals. It began to be used successfully throughout the technology industry, although somewhat behind the scenes. Some of the success was due to increasing computer power and some was achieved by focusing on specific isolated problems and pursuing them with the highest standards of scientific accountability. Still, the reputation of AI, in the business world at least, was less than pristine. Inside the field there was little agreement on the reasons for AI's failure to fulfill the dream of human-level intelligence that had captured the imagination of the world in the 1960s. Together, all these factors helped to fragment AI into competing subfields focused on particular problems or approaches, sometimes even under new names that disguised the tarnished pedigree of artificial intelligence. AI was both more cautious and more successful than it had ever been. On May 11, 1997, 
Deep Blue became the first computer chess playing system to beat a reigning world chess champion, Garry Kasparov. The supercomputer was a specialized version of a framework produced by IBM, and was capable of processing twice as many moves per second as it had during the first match, reportedly 200 million moves per second. The event was broadcast live over the internet and received over 74 million hits. Microworlds In 2005, a Stanford robot won the DARPA Grand Challenge by driving autonomously for 131 miles along an unrehearsed desert trail. Two years later, a team from CMU won the DARPA Urban Challenge by autonomously navigating 55 miles in an urban environment while adhering to traffic hazards and all traffic laws. In February 2011, in a Jeopardy! quiz show exhibition match, IBM's question answering system, Watson, defeated the two greatest Jeopardy! Champions, Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings, by a significant margin. These successes were not due to some revolutionary new paradigm, but mostly on the tedious application of engineering skill and on the tremendous power of computers today. In fact, Deep Blue's computer was 10 million times faster than the Ferranti Mark I that Christopher Strachey taught to play chess in 1951. This dramatic increase is measured by Moore's law, which predicts that the speed and memory capacity of computers doubles every two years. The fundamental problem of raw computer power was slowly being overcome. A new paradigm called intelligent agents became widely accepted during the 90s. Although earlier researchers had proposed modular divide and conquer approaches to AI, the intelligent agent did not reach its modern form until Judea Pearl, Alan Newell, Leslie P. Kalebling, and others brought concepts from decision theory and economics into the study of AI. When the economist's definition of a rational agent was married to computer science's definition of an object or module, the intelligent agent paradigm was complete. An intelligent agent is a system that perceives its environment and takes actions which maximize its chances of success. By this definition, simple programs that solve specific problems are intelligent agents, as are human beings and organizations of human beings, such as firms. The intelligent agent paradigm defines AI research as the study of intelligent agents. This is a generalization of some earlier definitions of AI, it goes beyond studying human intelligence, it studies all kinds of intelligence. The paradigm gave researchers license to study isolated problems and find solutions that were both verifiable and useful. It provided a common language to describe problems and share their solutions with each other and with other fields that also used concepts of abstract agents, like economics and control theory. It was hoped that a complete agent architecture would one day allow researchers to build more versatile and intelligent systems out of interacting intelligent agents. The Optimism AI researchers began to develop and use sophisticated mathematical tools more than they ever had in the past. There was a widespread realization that many of the problems that AI needed to solve were already being worked on by researchers in fields like mathematics, economics, or operations research. The shared mathematical language allowed both a higher level of collaboration with more established and successful fields and the achievement of results which were measurable and provable, AI had become a more rigorous scientific discipline. Russell and Norvig describe this as nothing less than a revolution and the victory of the Neats. Judea Pearl's highly influential 1988 book brought probability and decision theory into AI. Among the many new tools in use were Bayesian networks, 
hidden Markov models, information theory, stochastic modeling and classical optimization. Precise mathematical descriptions were also developed for computational intelligence paradigms like neural networks and evolutionary algorithms. The Money Algorithms originally developed by AI researchers began to appear as parts of larger systems. AI had solved a lot of very difficult problems and their solutions proved to be useful throughout the technology industry, such as data mining, industrial robotics, logistics, speech recognition, banking software, medical diagnosis, and Google's search engine. The field of AI received little or no credit for these successes in the 1990s and early 2000s. Many of AI's greatest innovations have been reduced to the status of just another item in the tool chest of computer science. Nick Bostrom explains a lot of cutting-edge AI has filtered into general applications, often without being called AI because once something becomes useful enough and common enough it's not labeled AI anymore. Robotics The first AI winter 1974-1980 Many researchers in AI in 1990s deliberately called their work by other names, such as informatics, knowledge-based systems, cognitive systems, or computational intelligence. In part, this may be because they considered their field to be fundamentally different from AI, but also the new names helped to procure funding. In the commercial world at least, the failed promises of the AI winter continued to haunt AI research into the 2000s, as the New York Times reported in 2005, computer scientists and software engineers avoided the term artificial intelligence for fear of being viewed as wild-eyed dreamers. In 1968, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick had imagined that by the year 2001, a machine would exist with an intelligence that matched or exceeded the capability of human beings. The character they created, HAL 9000, was based on a belief shared by many leading AI researchers that such a machine would exist by the year 2001. In 2001, AI founder Marvin Minsky asked so the question is why didn't we get HAL in 2001? Minsky believed that the answer is that the central problems, like common sense reasoning, were being neglected, while most researchers pursued things like commercial applications of neural nets or genetic algorithms. John McCarthy, on the other hand, still blamed the qualification problem. For Ray Kurzweil, the issue is computer power and, using Moore's law, he predicted that machines with human-level intelligence will appear by 2029. Jeff Hawkins argued that neural net research ignores the essential properties of the human cortex, preferring simple models that have been successful at solving simple problems. There were many other explanations and for each there was a corresponding research program underway. The Problems The End of Funding Critiques from Across Campus Perceptrons and the Dark Age of Connectionism The Neats, Logic and Symbolic Reasoning The Scruffies, Frames and Scripts Boom 1980-1987 The Rise of Expert Systems The Knowledge Revolution The Money Returns, The Fifth Generation Project the Revival of Connectionism Bust, The Second AI Winter 1987-1993 AI Winter The Importance of Having a Body, Nouvelle AI and Embodied Reason AI 1993-2001 Milestones and Moore's Law In the first decades of the 21st century, 
access to large amounts of data, faster computers, and advanced machine learning techniques were successfully applied to many problems throughout the economy. By 2016, the market for AI-related products, hardware, and software reached more than $8 billion and the New York Times reported that interest in AI had reached a frenzy. The applications of big data began to reach into other fields as well, such as training models in ecology and for various applications in economics. Advances in deep learning drove progress in research in image and video processing, text analysis, and even speech recognition. Deep learning is a branch of machine learning that models high-level abstractions in data by using a deep graph with many processing layers. According to the Universal Approximation Theorem, deepness isn't necessary for a neural network to be able to approximate arbitrary continuous functions. Even so, there are many problems that are common to shallow networks that deep networks help avoid. As such, Deep neural networks are able to realistically generate much more complex models as compared to their shallow counterparts. However, deep learning has problems of its own. A common problem for recurrent neural networks is the vanishing gradient problem, which is where gradients passed between layers gradually shrink and literally disappear as they are rounded off to zero. There have been many methods developed to approach this problem. State-of-the-art deep neural network architectures can sometimes even rival human accuracy in fields like computer vision, specifically on things like the NIST database, and traffic sign recognition. Language processing engines powered by smart search engines can easily beat humans at answering general trivia questions and recent developments in deep learning have produced astounding results in competing with humans, in things like Go and Doom. Artificial general intelligence research aims to create machines that can solve any problem that requires intelligence. Intelligent Agents Victory of the Neats AI Behind the Scenes Where is HAL 9000? Deep Learning, Big Data, and Artificial General Intelligence, 2000 Present Deep Learning Artificial General Intelligence Notes